So this talk is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about co-limits and exactness. Um, so more specifically, it'll be about the following problem. So suppose we've got a lot of exact sequences of modules over a ring um, indexed by elements i inside some category j. And suppose we've got suitable morphisms between all these elements. So we've got a functor from j to modules. Then the question is, is the following sequence exact? So if we take zero goes to the co-limit over j of a i goes to the co-limit of b i's goes to the co-limit of all the c i's. And we can ask, is this exact? So this is part of a general problem that pretty much whenever we've got a functor um, involving modules, we want to know whether it preserves exactness. Um, so first of all, it preserves right exactness um, in all cases. Um, in, in other words, if we miss out the zero here, then if all these are exact, then then this is exact. Um, and there are two ways to see this. Um, so um, method one, we could observe that taking co-limits is um, um, left adjoint to um, a diagonal functor. So, so what we've got here is, is a functor from our category of modules to the category of, mod, of, of functors from, from our category J to modules. And if we've got any module M, then we can just have a functor from J to modules that just takes everything in J to M. So if, if J is, say, um, a, a, a category with two objects and two morphisms, then the corresponding um, functor from J to M will just be to take everything here. And the, the corresponding left adjoint functor takes some sort of um, functor from J to modules to the co-limit, which is in this case will just be the quotient of B by whatever you need to make these two morphisms the same. And um, left adjoints, are always right exact. So um, in particular, co-limits are, are left adjoint, so, so they preserve right exactness. So that's the first method. Um, method two, um, method two is as follows. Um, the, the point is that co-limits commute with co-limits. So the, the point is, if you've got an exact sequence A goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero, then C is just the co-limit of these two maps. We've got the map from A to B that we started with, and we've also got the zero map from A to B. So um, what, what we want to say is that co-limit of a quotient is equal to a quotient of co-limits, and as a quotient is a special sort of co-limit, um, the, the fact that co-limits commute with quotients is a special case of the fact that co-limits commute with co-limits. So the next question is why do co-limits commute with co-limits? Um, well, the easiest way to see this is to just look at a sort of example. So I suppose one of the categories just has two objects and two morphisms, and the other has, say, three objects and a couple of morphisms that looks like this. Um, then you can consider the sort of product of two of these two categories, which is going to look like this. And you can take co-limits of the first category, and this will give you um, some objects here. So here um, we're taking the co-limit along each row, so to speak. 
And we can also take co-limits along the column. And if we do that, we will get um, some things there. And then we can take the co-limit of these things or the co-limit of these things. And we want to know if they're the same. So you get some sort of thing here. And you can see that this, whatever object this is, is both the co-limit of this diagram and of this diagram, because it's in fact the co-limit of the whole thing. So, so the co-limit of this um, will be this object here. And this is fairly easy to check. I'm not going to actually do it. And the only thing I'm going to observe is that this is rather similar to Fubini's theorem um, in integration theory. So in Fubini's theorem, if you've got a function of two variables, fx, y, dx, you can either integrate with respect to x and then integrate with respect to y, or you can integrate with respect to y and then integrate with respect to x. Or you can do a sort of double integral, two-dimensional um, Lebesgue integral. Um, and all these three integrals are the same under suitable conditions on f. And the same thing sort of happens with co-limits. You, you can either take co-limits horizontally, then take them vertically, or you can take them vertically, then take them horizontally, or you can take a sort of super co-limit where you do both at once, and all three of these produce the same answer. So this is a sort of Fubinius theorem for co-limits. Um, in particular, we see that um, the co-limit functor over j is right exact. And if we've got any right exact functor, it has um, a, a derived functor, uh, which could be written as colim one um, over j. So um, I'm not going to say very much about this derived functor because nobody seems to use it very much. Um, so um, what we now want to ask is, um, what about left exactness? So we can ask, is a co-limit of injective maps injective? In other words, is this co-limit functor left exact and therefore exact because we've just shown it's right exact. And the answer is no. And it's quite easy to give examples of this. Um, so suppose we take the co-limit of two maps, Z mapping to two or zero to Z. So the co-limit, and let me put the co-limit in green. So here, the co-limit is going to be z modulo 2z. On the other hand, we can have a map from the rationals to the rationals, which um, takes uh, is multiplication by two. And the co-limit of these is zero. And now the integers are a subset of the rationals. So these maps here are injective. So here we're taking a, um, a co-limit of injective maps and um, this map here is not injective. Well, you might quibble that we're taking a co-limit over a funny category instead of taking a co-limit over a directed set. But even if you take a co-limit direct, over a directed set, it doesn't preserve co-limits. Um, so here's a second example. Suppose you take z mapping to z mapping to z, um, where this is um, multiplication by two, or you could take Q mapping to Q and Q with multiplication by two there. And here you find the co-limit is the rationals, and here you find the co-limit is Z modulo 2Z plus Z. And again, this group here is not a submodule of this group here. So Co-limits don't preserve exactness, even if you just take co-limits over directed sets. However, um, um, 
um, a co-limit of so a, a co-limit over a filtered category. Let's spell filtered. Filtered does preserve exactness. So this is a very important um, case in which taking co-limits over filtered categories differs from taking co-limits over possibly unfiltered categories. So in order to see this, we first need a special property of um, filtered co-limits or filtered co-limits. And the key point is here is that a filtered co-limit of modules um, mi um, is can be written as the following. It, 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 you take the disjoint union of all the mi and you quotient out by the following equivalence relation. We say that mi is equal to mj here, mi in mi and mj in mj. Um, if um, we can find a map from i and j to k so that mi and mj have the same image in mk. So here's the element mi and here's the element mj and you can look at their images in here and they should both have the same image. Um, so this gives um, a relation on um, the disjoint union. And the key point is that this relation is an equivalence relation. And the proof that it's an equivalence relation uses the fact um, that J is filtered. And it's easy to see this by drawing a little diagram. So, so suppose we've got these elements mi and mj, and suppose mi is equivalent to mj. What this means is that from i and j, you can find maps to a third um, element of the category such that mi and mj become equal. And then mj is equivalent to mk. And this means that if we take mk here, then mj and mk become equal in this category here. Well, now what we can do is we can use the fact the category is filtered to find um, a new object here and arrows like this. And now is the image of mi and this equal to the image of mk in this? Well, not necessarily, but what we can do now is we've got two maps from mj to this element here, and we can now find another object here and a map here, making these two maps equal if you compose them with this map. And now you can see that mi and mk have the same image. So mi is equivalent to mk. And this proves the relation is transitive and proving it is symmetric and reflexive is um, very easy. So it is, in fact, an equivalence relation. So um, the fact that the category is filtered means you can define the co-limit in this way. Notice that if the category is not filtered, then you can't generally do this. For example, um, if your category just looks like this, then the co-limit of two modules is going to be mi direct sum mj. And there is usually absolutely no reason why the direct sum of two modules should be their union quotiented out by something. In fact, it never will be unless the two mod one of the two modules happens to be zero. So this result definitely fails for non-filtered categories. So um, um, now we can use it to show that a filtered uh, co-limit um, of injective maps 
is injective. Um, and this is quite easy. Suppose we've got elements m i contained in n i for i in your category j and suitable maps between them. And um, we want to show that the limit or the co-limit of the m i is contained in the co-limit of the n i. So let's put a question mark to minus that's what we want to prove. Um, so suppose we've got um, some element um, m i in um, um, m i whose, whose image in, in the co-limit of n i is zero. So we've got m i and it's going to map to some element n i in capital n i and because the limit because this has image zero it means there must be some element j in the category um, such that n i has image zero in n j well then the um we, we have the corresponding image of m i in m j must map to zero so mj equals zero as the map from mj to nj is injective. So mi is zero in the co-limit because its image under some map of j is zero. So this shows that filtered co-limits are of injectors are injective. So in terms of the derived functor, we can say that the co-limit um, that the first derived functor of a co-limit vanishes if the, the, the category J is filtered. Um, so uh, I should add a sort of awful warning here. So we can do the same for limits instead of co-limits. So co-limits are right exact, and we find that limits um, over a category J is always left exact. However, it need not be, be right exact, even if the category is filtered. Um, so um, we'll see an example of this fairly soon in, a, in, a, in an upcoming lecture. So in other words, the, um, um, the, the, the derived functor of the, uh, sorry, that should have been an inverse limit. So the inverse limit is always left exact. Um, however, limits or inverse limits, their derived functor um, need not vanish even if the category is filtered. Um, finally, we want to discuss co-limits of flat modules. So what we're going to show is that a filtered co-limit of flat modules is flat. Notice that an unfiltered co-limit of flat modules need not be need not be flat, of course. A fairly simple example of this is the fact that any module is a co-limit of flat modules not necessarily filtered, because we can just take um, a resolution of it by free modules. So for any module, it's a quotient of a free module, and the kernel is the image of another free module. And these modules are both free and therefore flat. So M is the co-limit of R to the star goes to um, R to the star. Um, it, it, it's, it's a co-limit of 
two maps between between three modules. So the fact that the limit is filtered here is absolutely essential. Um, and this is quite easy to prove. So um, suppose that M is the co-limit of some modules MI. So for MI, um, MI is flat, and this is a filtered co-limit. And suppose we want to show that M is flat. So let's take an exact sequence. Naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero. And then we notice that naught goes to A, tensor MI, goes to B, tensor MI, goes to C, tensor MI, goes to naught is exact. We're assuming this is exact, of course. And this follows because MI is exact. And now we notice that naught goes to the co-limit of A tensor MI, goes to co-limit of B tensor MI, goes to co-limit C tensor MI, goes to naught is exact. And this follows because co-limit preserves exactness. And here um, we are assuming that this is a filtered co-limit so this is where we use the fact that we're taking a filtered co-limits. And finally, we see that naught goes to A tensor co-limit of MI, goes to B tensor co-limit of MI, goes to C tensor co-limit of MI, goes to naught is exact. And this is because taking tensor products commutes with taking co-limits. So we've shown that if we start with an exact sequence, then tensioning it with the co-limit of the MI is also exact, which means the co-limit of all the MI is um, not exact, flat. Um, incidentally, there's a converse to this theorem, which says that any flat module is a filtered co-limit of finitely generated free modules. And what we've proved is that any co-limit of finitely generated free modules is flat. So Lazard's theorem um, says that a module is flat if and only if it's a co-limit of finitely generated flat modules. I should add a slight warning here. The proof of this theorem in Eisenberg's book appears to have a slight gap in it. So if you want to see a complete proof, you can check Lazard's original paper. Um, okay, so that's enough about co-limits. Um, next lecture, we will probably be discussing um, um, limits and flatness.